this company hired, I'm assuming, very expensive <laughs> lawyers to send me paperwork and to make phone calls and emails to me and my assistant at the time that were so incredibly scary. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapy things on this channel. And today we are talking about something that I haven't been able to talk about for a very long time, but I'm fucking over it. We're talking about it today. Um, I'm gonna have a lot of strong feelings in this video just as a heads up. Hold on, sorry, my notes turned themselves off. Because if you have been here for any length of time, you will know that I made a video called why I turned down a sponsorship from BetterHelp or a thousand dollar sponsorship from BetterHelp or something. I'll put the thumbnail up here uh, so you guys can see it, but I had to take that video down uh, because I got a very strongly worded cease and desist letter from BetterHelp. I got a phone call. Yeah, that's true. I got a cease and desist letter and several uh, phone calls that made me very uncomfy. And so I made the decision to take the video down to avoid uh, further action. But we're talking about it today because there has been some developments in this story. And so um, first of all, I'm over. Uh, being muzzled and not getting to talk about this in the way that I think we ought to be talking about it, but also because some of those developments um, will sound familiar to you guys who've been here before. So I'm going to recap uh, what was in that original video for you guys and also um, more efficiently, more succinctly tell you the story of why I turned down a sponsorship from BetterHelp as a licensed therapist. So let's get into it. Blah, 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 blah. So in the video that is now private, gone, disappeared on my channel, the very first thing that I addressed in that video was the privacy issue. I want to address this because uh, the word on the street at the time that I made the video was that BetterHelp allowed allegedly had shared consumer information uh, with advertisers for the purpose of creating more effective targeted ads. And in my opinion, as a clinician, that's wholly inappropriate to be using information that was provided to you by consumers in good faith in the hopes of that information staying confidential to then have that be used for advertising purposes. Uh, this was the crux of the issue. BetterHelp brought up to me in their cease and desist letter and in their many phone calls and emails and their statements. Uh, actually, I think I have it, hold on. Hold please. Uh, if you're a patron, actually, you have an original copy uh, of the cease and desist letter on a mug that says Better Help Tears. Uh, so if you want that, by the way, go subscribe to our Patreon. <laughs> There's a link in the description. So the cease and desist letter that Better Help sent to me states the following in quotes. The following are examples of falsehood, misrepresentations, and disparaging remarks you have made, but this list is far from exhaustive. These include false allegations that Better Help shares, mines, or even sells information from the intake questionnaire or personal data of users, such as blah, 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 uh, with third party advertisers. So I bring this to your attention and this is the reason that we're making the video today because as recently as March of this year, the FTC um, or the Federal Trade Commission, why is this pulling up critical role? Okay, so the reason that I'm bringing this up and that I'm reading you all of this is because in July, uh, July 14th, 2023 to be exact, the FTC released a uh, write up on their website about BetterHelp and the title of this states, and I quote, FTC gives final approval to order banning BetterHelp from sharing sensitive health data for ad advertising requiring it to pay $7.8 million. There's several other quotes from this article that I want to share with you. Um, but <laughs> I really want to draw people's attention to this because as a clinician, I feel compelled to highlight the differences in the way that this situation has allegedly gone down uh, and the way that traditional safe psychotherapy is supposed to work according to the ethics and uh, rules and statutes uh, that psychotherapists have to abide by. As a licensed practicing psychotherapist, I can speak pretty effectively to this, um, especially because I live in Arizona, which has uh, particularly stringent regulations about confidentiality and privacy and all of the ways that therapists are supposed to conduct themselves in order to remain safe and healthy people so that we can do our best work for our clients. The thing that is uh, paramount and like at this point kind of a cliche in the therapy community is that therapy is supposed to be confidential, right? If you've ever been to therapy in any capacity, a clinician or somebody somewhere, probably in an intake packet, has given you a disclaimer that everything that you disclose in therapy by law, by our moral and ethical codes also um, is required to stay confidential. We can't discuss that information with anybody. We can't even confirm or deny that we know who you are. This is why, for example, I give all of my clients a disclaimer um, upon intake that if I ever do happen to see you out and about in public, I won't acknowledge you, not because I don't like 
like you, not because I don't care, but because that's illegal. I'm not allowed to do that. It could potentially put someone in a situation where they're forced to say, oh, that's my therapist. It's different for what it's worth if clients want to come up to their therapist and be like, hey, that's my therapist, that's totally fine. Check with your specific therapist, I guess, if you really want to. Um, but the reason that I bring this up is because the lengths that therapists have to go to to protect your confidentiality are <laughs> severe. And it's for good reason. The whole way that therapy works and is most effective is that we feel safe to make these very vulnerable disclosures to someone who is in essence a stranger with the guarantee that that information won't be used as part of gossip or used um, to better uh, advantage that therapist specifically. We take this on as part of the sacred role of being a safe person, of being a person who helps people work through stuff. And that's just part of the gig, right? There are many, many laws in place, both federally and at, at the state level in the United States anyways, that are intended to protect the privacy and confidentiality of psychotherapy patients. The other reason that I wanted to clarify this with you is because with the advent of telehealth and people having video sessions with therapists, there has been some confusion about what exactly this means. I do wanna be super clear here, there is an inherent risk in conducting psychotherapy via the internet because we can't account for or in all cases um, completely avoid technological failures and things like that. Especially for example, if like a client leaves open their laptop that has their therapy information on it, technically that's a breach of confidentiality, but it's difficult for therapists to avoid this because of the nature of the beast. You get it. However, along with all of this though, things have not changed. Therapists who are conducting psychotherapy sessions through video means or through telehealth or whatever are still still not taking anybody's fucking data, least of all their private health information and using that in any capacity, allowing that information to be used in any capacity um, for any purpose other than explicitly stated and agreed to psychotherapy goals. What happened with BetterHelp allegedly, according to the FTC write-up, here, let me read it to you. There's a real quote, let me just read it. Okay, again, I'm using the word allegedly, by the way, just as protective language. Um, I'm not really in the business of collecting cease and desist letters for fun, but the quote directly directly from the article that's on the FTC website that I will link in the description for you guys to go read, says, and I quote, in an action first announced in March, the FTC charged that BetterHelp used and disclosed consumers' email addresses, IP addresses, and health questionnaire information to Facebook, Snapchat, Critio, I don't know what that is, uh, and Pinterest for advertising purposes, despite promising consumers that it would only use or disclose personal health data for limited purposes. I'll link the full write-up of this in the description, by the way. There's several documents that outline the accusations, the information gathering that the FTC did, the actual verdict, and then the disciplinary action that took place. If you want to get into all of that, feel free. I've read all of that. Um, it's, it's quite lengthy, but I've highlighted a lot of the pieces that are pertinent here um, for our discussion. The reason that I bring this up and why I as a clinician don't recommend BetterHelp as an entity is because this kind of breach in trust with people who are, again, engaging in a process that's intended to be like somewhat sacred, um, to me is unforgivable. I. Also, I wanna pause here really quickly. I said this in the original video and apparently it fell on deaf ears for a lot of people, fucking BetterHelp included. If you are a person who currently uses BetterHelp, who likes BetterHelp, who has a therapist on there that you have great rapport with, that's none of my business, right? Like that's totally fine. I am not here to make the claim that everyone should get off of BetterHelp and never go back. Like that's not helpful. I think it's very important that we acknowledge that we live in a capitalist dystopian nightmare. And in some ways the access to therapy uh, will require us to engage with companies like BetterHelp because there's an accessibility factor there, right? That's fine. Again, that's none of my DNA business and I'm not here to tell you what to do. Again, especially if you're deriving benefit from the service, I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. Obviously, as a therapist, I'm pro therapy and I want people to just be able to access the help that they deserve and that they need. Okay, brief pause because I just want to be clear that that disclaimer also applies to the therapists who work on BetterHelp. First and foremost, I want to clarify that by no means am I asserting or alleging that all therapists who work on BetterHelp are terrible therapists. That's just simply not true and that's also not how that works. I also want to be clear that the criticism, the ire, the frustration that I have here is for better help the entity as a conglomerate and a corporation, not about the specific individuals involved. I think it's perfectly possible and important to hold in both hands at the same time that while yes, there are very much consumers who have expressed frustration about receiving services from therapists who are not the most ethical and not the most well-trained, and also that there are still very much credentialed, respectable, appropriate professionals on the platform. And so this is not me saying all therapists should get off better help. That's just simply disingenuous. Genuous, and again, not the point of this video. Okay, thanks, let's keep going. However, the reason that I wanna talk about this is because I think it's important that for people who are making the choice to participate in a service like this, that they have the right and the opportunity to be informed and conscientious consumers. 
if again you find value and benefit in using BetterHelp and the privacy potential privacy issues or the past alleged privacy issues aren't a concern for you that's perfectly fine but I just think it's important that people have the opportunity to make that choice for themselves the thing that really gets under my fucking skin is that this information was allegedly potentially concealed from consumers there are other quotes that we're going to talk about in the article about the way that BetterHelp responded to these accusations and these issues that the FTC brought to their attention that to me don't convey an attitude of like good faith when we talk about consumer well-being and care and compassion for the people who are utilizing this service and so for me that's enough of a deal breaker to say that like as a clinician I'm not recommending this to my clients to any of you on this channel um, I'm not leveraging my platform um, my credentials, my experience, my knowledge to recommend something to people that could potentially have negative consequences to them. I wanna read you guys a little bit uh, from the complaint on the FTC website. Again, I will link the whole thing in the description if you wanna read it in its entirety, but there are some things that felt especially important for me to highlight for you guys here. So before I read this, actually, I do wanna clarify uh, the word respondent is referring to better help. Um, again, I'm reading you guys like essentially legal paperwork, so like bear with me. Service refers to better help, uh, like the, the service that better help is providing and respondent refers to um, like the employees, the sort of proverbial powers that be at BetterHelp. So from 2013 to December, 2020, however, respondent continually broke these privacy promises, monetizing consumers' health information to target them and others with advertisements for the service. For example, from 2018 to 2020, respondent used these consumers' email addresses and the fact that they had previously been in therapy to instruct Facebook to identify similar consumers and target them with advertisements for the service, bringing in 10 of thousands of new paying users and millions of dollars in revenue as a result. The other thing that I want to show you right now is a clip of the original video. BetterHelp is collecting information from people who use their services, so their app. They're collecting a number of pieces of information from you and then selling it to advertisers like Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and like blah, blah, blah. So listen, I know that there's probably gonna be a fair amount of comments from people who are like, you're just sour grapes, but blah, blah, blah. I am, I am fucking sour grapes. I'm bitter and I'm petty and I'm mad because the reason that I made this video was purely to inform people about the potential risks, about the alleged misconduct that was occurring here, again, because I'm passionate about people getting the access to the services that they, they deserve, but doing it in a way that's actually safe for them, that will actually provide them the best chance at receiving benefit. And so when I made this video, it wasn't meant to be a takedown of BetterHelp because I just have personal beef with them. Um, we have talked about the potential influence and negative impact that BetterHelp could have on the therapy industry as a whole. I'll put that video up here. But I want to be super clear, as a, a clinician, I have no skin in this game in the sense that like my uh, caseload is full. I'm not taking new clients. I'm not mad at BetterHelp because I want the clients that they're taking. I don't care. This is not about that. I'm angry because the, the platform and the whole fucking reason that I started this YouTube channel was to help people find reliable, safe, approachable, accessible help, ideally therapy, but help generally um, to improve their mental health, to improve their quality mental health, their health, their improve their quality of life, um, and to do that in a way that's not going to potentially harm them. BetterHelp at the time allegedly was conducting themselves in a way that was flying in the face of all of those goals. And so I just made the video to inform people that these are potential risks. And again, if this is something that's not a deal breaker for you, that's fine. But I think it's important that we as adult human beings <laughs> have the right to make those decisions for ourselves rather than having that information concealed from us allegedly um, in the hopes of trying to make as much money off of us as possible because again I want to be super clear I've talked a lot about uh, the industry norms in therapy and while I think there is very much um, growth and adjustment and like meeting at the table that therapists need to do with therapy consumers especially because therapists historically have not done a great job of being particularly accessible um, or approachable for like the general public um, I think it's important to hold that in one hand while also acknowledging that the way that some companies better help included allegedly are handled handling this um, is not the way, right? There, again, there's lots of growth that therapists in the therapy industry needs to make. And also I want to highlight for folks that the people who by and large get involved in this field and who want to do the work that we're doing 
do it because we care deeply about the people that we're interacting with. We became therapists all like on our own paths and whatever, but I think there's like a sort of central bond that we share in the sense that we just give a lot of fucks about people and we want people to be happy. We want people to live their best lives. And the way that we do that is important. There, There is like a right and wrong way to do this in the sense of like not endangering our clients, right? It really fucking pushes my buttons to see capitalism leeching itself into these really uh, sacred and sensitive parts of our lives and corrupting this industry to be more about making a profit than it is about providing people actual benefit. Okay, I wanna read you another section from this complaint uh, from the FTC website. This is referring to the misrepresentations um, in terms of the privacy and confidentiality policy and how users' data the way that BetterHelp was going to use user data was misrepresented, allegedly, according to the FTC. These misrepresentations went on for years because until no earlier than January, 2021, respondent did nothing to ensure that its collection, use, and disclosure practices complied with their privacy promises to visitors and users. Indeed, neither the head of respondent's marketing team nor the analyst whom respondent put in charge of advertising on Facebook reviewed the privacy policy on a regular basis basis and there was no company requirement that anyone on the marketing team review the policy until no earlier than January 2021. For those of you who are not tracking, essentially what this is saying is that there was not a formalized company-wide policy about the ways that BetterHelp's conduct aligned with their privacy policy until at least January of 2021. For those of you who aren't aware, BetterHelp has been providing this service until, at least as far as the FTC is concerned, this misconduct was occurring um, as early as 2017. That's several years of misconduct that allegedly occurred without any meaningful action being taken on a company-wide level. This is fucking egregious. I want <laughs> to acknowledge again that therapy, especially community mental health, it's slow to evolve, right? It's a very bureaucratic, like, thing, um, trying to evolve the practices and the way that we do things, it's slow and stupid and it's difficult. However, if any community mental health agency had this type of misconduct occurring for years and years and years, I can guarantee fucking tee you that that community mental health agency would cease to exist. I also forgot to mention this when we originally recorded this video, but I wanted to point out that the decision-making authority over use of their Facebook advertising services was a junior marketing analyst who was a recent college graduate and had never worked in marketing and had no experience and little training in safeguarding consumers' health information. That person also still works at BetterHelp under the title senior marketing analyst. So again, I'm not here to tell people what to do or what the quote unquote right or wrong thing is to do. But when we ask the question about whether a person or an entity has made the appropriate steps to earn back our trust after a betrayal of that trust, information like this is important to weigh when we ask that question, right? Like part of making informed and empowered decisions about our own medical care is being aware of like who's actively involved in this process. And so like this is very key information to be aware of in my opinion. I think I also, I want to encourage people to be aware of this. Um, we've talked about this before, um, but especially in regards to private practice clinicians, for those of you who are seeing a licensed therapist, that means that they're licensed with whatever your state board is. Um, and you can actually look up like the disciplinary actions. You can look up the board meeting minutes in most places, at least. Um, I can't speak to every single state, but like it's pretty common for you to be able to look up the board meeting minutes and, and things like that. And to be aware of like what disciplinary actions are taking place. And so there's a level of transparency that exists here, right? And like, this is by design. I think it's incredibly important that for people, especially if you have a complaint, with a therapist that you can pretty easily bring this up to the board and have disciplinary action taken like relatively quickly. I've seen people lose their licenses in the span of a year with whole disciplinary actions and all of this stuff, like all of these meetings and, and proceedings that have occurred um, in a relatively short time for people, like their career is just straight up over. This, the way that this is handled is not at all reflective of the way that therapy uh, like traditional psychotherapy functions as an institution. And that's a really important distinction for us to make. Okay, I wanna read you a couple of things. I know that this is just me reading a lot of stuff to you, but stay with me. The complaint goes on to say, these harms were not reasonably avoidable by consumers. It was effectively impossible for visitors and users to know that respondent was using and disclosing their health information for advertising purposes because respondent actively concealed the practices through repeated misrepresentations and lack of notice. I'd also like to draw your attention to this section of my original video. After these TikToks went viral, BetterHelp actually responded and said, that's not true. We're not doing that. Therapy Den called them out again and said, 
Well, yes it is. You can see it clearly in your privacy policy. And then shortly after that, BetterHelp's comments were deleted or they deleted their comments. And then the privacy policy was changed to be much more difficult to understand. It's now a lot more vague than it was. And it is confusing to try and read and understand what exactly is happening. So I think if that's not an indicator about the shadiness that's going on there, I don't know what is. Indeed, as described in paragraph 62, numerous users expressed outrage at the disclosures upon learning of them. The complaint goes on to say, these harms were not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. Indeed, respondent compromised consumers' health information for respondents' own financial benefit through the growth of its user base, which only compounded these injuries by subjecting more visitors and users to respondents' deceptive and unfair practices. The thing that really gets me and that really pushes my fucking buttons is that BetterHelp is aware that these are issues. They know that this is a problem. This has been brought to their attention many times and they are choosing to do nothing anyway. I just, like I, uh, I'm boiling with rage right now because I just, I, the other thing that I wanted to address here in this video, this is, we're gonna take a brief detour into like Mickey is a human here that I wanna talk about. The way that I was communicated with by this entity was incredibly fucking alarming. I just, I tried really hard at the time to shut the fuck up about it because I was like, don't get sued, don't get sued, don't get sued. But I do just really wanna draw people's attention to the fact that this is a company that makes millions, if not billions of dollars. The the parent company of BetterHelp um, is a very large um, like medical conglomerate that buys up lots of other small medical businesses and things like that. This company hired, I'm assuming, very expensive <laughs> lawyers to send me paperwork and to make phone calls and emails to me and my assistant at the time that were so incredibly fucking scary. I just really think that it's important to highlight that my channel at the time, do you remember how many subscribers I had? My, my channel at the time had not hit 100K for sure. We were very, very much firmly in the micro influencer category. Um, the video had maybe a couple hundred thousand views on it. If I think it was like 100,000 views maybe. And I was on the receiving end of communication that felt very, very scary for me. I just think it's important for us to talk about this in regards to the things that the FTC has come out and said now, because the way that I communicated this to consumers <laughs> or, or to people on my channel, um, again, was with the goal of just allowing people to make an informed and conscientious choice about whether the benefits outweighed the risks for them, right? I never said that BetterHelp should not exist or that I hated BetterHelp and that I didn't want them to exist anymore or whatever. And the way that BetterHelp communicated to me was first of all, very much in bad faith, but second of all, to me felt very, very threatening. And that's just my opinion. I'm not saying that they threatened me. I'm just saying that I felt very threatened and I genuinely <laughs> was terrified about what the fuck was going to happen to me because the reality is that this company whose pockets were far deeper than mine communicated to me in a way that felt very much like we are going to ruin your life if you don't shut the fuck up about this. And there was a lot of feedback from my audience and like, bless you guys. Thank you for being supportive. But there was a lot of feedback about people saying they're just trying to scare you, like say whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. But I just really want to be clear that at the time I chose to take the video down because it felt like I had no other recourse. Like I felt like I didn't have anywhere else to go because the reality is that I don't have fucking money. I don't know what your guys' impression of my financial status is, but it's certainly not enough to get in a big giant legal thing with a company of this size and this influence. And so I felt very much like I had no options in this circumstance. And so now, especially with all of this information that's coming out from the FTC, I'm really fucking mad <laughs> that my life got upturned and I walked through all of this like anxiety and, and destabilization for months, if not like the span of like more than a year, um, only to find out that all of the fucking things that I originally said have been corroborated by the FTC. So yeah, I just, I wanna be super clear again, like I'm, I wanna talk about this as a clinician from the clinical lens, like as a therapist, but I also, um, can't help but be a person in this equation because this was genuinely a scary thing to happen to me. One other thing that I wanted to highlight for you guys before we talk about all the other reasons that I would never accept a BetterHelp sponsorship is that the FTC, um, under the proposed order, BetterHelp will provide uh, partial refunds to customers who use the service from August 1st of 2017 until the end of 2020, the FTC said. So I will include a link in the description for you guys uh, if you want to apply for or like indicate your eligibility for a refund. The FTC does this a lot anytime there are rulings like this. So if you're entitled to a refund, go get your refund, y'all. It's my money and I need it now. It's my money and I need it now. 
speaking of money, let's talk about one of the other complaints that I had in the original video, which is that BetterHelp doesn't pay therapists very well. I think in the original video, the language that I use BetterHelp took issue with, and so we will do our best to stick to my opinion. Um, I wanna be super clear here. Um, there's no definitive way, I guess, at least I'm not a statistician, so there's no definitive way for me to say what is like the correct amount of money for a therapist to make. But from my perspective, my opinion as a therapist, the amount that folks may or may not supposedly be earning from BetterHelp doesn't seem fair to me. So let's talk about the actual like numbers, like dollars and cents. First and foremost, uh, BetterHelp has an income calculator on their website. When you are a prospective therapist looking to sign up for them, they have this little like slidey bar thing that helps you estimate how much money you could potentially make with them depending on how many hours you work. And there are many issues. <laughs> I take with this. First and foremost, um, we talked about this in the original video, but it's fairly common for folks, at least it was at the time, to be receiving cold emails from BetterHelp advertising their service to clinicians saying, come work for us, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and then including this scale, this like table um, about potentially how much money you can make. And to me, first of all, the amount of money that therapists have self-reported making on the service is wholly inappropriate, but also even just by looking at the estimates that BetterHelp provides, we're really seeing an issue here in, in terms of how therapists are being compensated. So first of all, BetterHelp's income estimator tool estimates your annual income before taxes, and they also base that on a 52 week year which is a fallacy. Nobody fucking works 52 weeks a year. That's absolutely insane. Um, I'm sure some people work 52 weeks a year, but especially in therapy, it's incredibly common for people to not work all 52 weeks of the year. People need fucking time off, especially when you do work that's traumatizing, that requires you to be very um, emotionally involved with people. It's incredibly common. It's very normal for people to need time off. We should really normalize that as a society anyways. So it also assumes that the hours that you're working um, are the same as the number of clients that you're seeing, which is also a fact. This is very surprising to folks, um, especially, I again, this is one of those areas where it's important to us honor that uh, therapy as an institution has some growing to do and also um, other things can be true at the same time. A lot of people um, are surprised and frustrated by the prices of therapy, commonly because first of all, it, it makes it difficult to access for a lot of people, which is super fair. I really wanna validate that, especially again, because we are all locked into this shitty capitalist dystopian nightmare where we're forced to sell our time and our labor in order for the right to survive. Um, and that causes us to be pitted against each other sometimes, especially when we talk about skilled labor like this, where in order for a therapist to survive and pay their bills, sometimes they're required to charge rates that aren't accessible then. And so we have this inherent disagreement, except that the problem is not that therapists are charging too much, it's a societal issue. You get it. Anyways, the reason that I wanna talk about this is because oftentimes folks will sort of balk at the price of uh, therapy as it being like by the hour, like how could you charge, you know, I don't know, $100 an hour. Um, that's like a crazy amount of money, right? Um, or $200 an hour or whatever. Um, and I just want to remind folks um, or let people know, I guess, if you're not aware, that when therapists charge that amount of money, they're not just charging you for that singular 50 minutes or 60 minutes. They're charging you for the time that it takes to do your paperwork, that it takes to do your intake, that it takes to submit your insurance paperwork potentially, but they're also charging you for the cost of their electricity, the cost of their electronic health record software thing. They're charging you for the cost of potentially paying someone to do their accounting. They're charging you for the cost of keeping their electricity on and the cost of their office and the cost of maintaining their license, undergoing continued education units to maintain their license. They're charging you for the student loans that they have to pay back. They're charging you for having to pay for their own health insurance, especially if they work for themselves. Um, and they're also charging you for self-employment taxes. For those of you who are not aware, BetterHelp doesn't hire therapists typically on a, like an employee basis where they pay your employee taxes for you, where you get like W-2s at the end of the year. That's not typically how it works. Usually the way that this shakes out is that you are hired on as a 1099 or a, a contractor, which means that you're responsible for paying your own quarterly taxes. Roughly, the estimate is around 35% of your income is dedicated to taxes. So right off the bat, 35% of your income is gone. Um, and then on top of that, again, all of the other uh, things that I already listed, therapists have to sort of cover the cost of. So besides the fact that it is skilled labor and that we should acknowledge that skilled labor, it's okay, it's valid for people to want to make a living wage off of this skilled labor that requires them to go to school for years and years. But also on top of that, it's not quite as simple as like, 
$100 for these 50 minutes. It's just simply not how it works. When we talk about BetterHelp, um, their income calculator is wild to me. It does seem to change. It doesn't seem to be a static amount of money that you make per hour, depending on how many hours you work. The amount seems to change. So the minimum amount of hours that it lets you calculate for is five hours or five clients per week, which they estimate would be $7,800 annually before taxes. So after taxes, your take home amount of money would be $5,070, which equates to about $19.50 an hour. Listen, I understand, especially for people who are contractors, um, that there is, you know, like working five hours a week is not a lot of hours. And so like, sure, fair enough, right? However, $19.50 an hour for people that are required to have a master's degree at least and also be maintaining an independent license, which if you're not aware, in most states requires you to have at least several thousand hours of supervised practice, pass an exam, do the thing, get your license, and then you're allowed to work for better help essentially. $19.50 is like really <laughs> pushing it already in my opinion. The other thing that I wanna draw your attention to is that some therapists have reported, and again, this is just alleged. I don't know that this is true. This is purely speculation based on some things that other therapists have said. Some therapists have communicated that their sessions are not always compensated on a 50 minute or 60 minute timetable. Sometimes those sessions are actually 45 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, and so you get paid accordingly. So for example, with BetterHelp's income estimator tool, if you're conducting a 45 minute session, you'd be making $14.62, or for a 30 minute session, you'd be making $9.75. Again, I am the last person on fucking planet earth to be like, therapist should be fucking independently wealthy billionaire. Like, fuck that shit. That, that's not what I believe in. However, $9.75 for a 30 minute session uh, of clinical psychotherapy, again, with all of the barriers to entry involved is absolutely fucking egregious. Especially when you take into context that these people are still having to do the paperwork, the bookkeeping uh, nuts and bolts the administrative, that's what I'm looking for, the administrative parts of therapy on top of having to do this 30 minute session already. We're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the other rates uh, from the estimated, the income estimator, but I also wanted to draw people's attention to a video that was made by another creator here on the platform. I'll link it in the description. She talks about um, her own opinions <laughs> about better help. And one of the things that she brought up that I think is a really important point is that the model of a therapist being paid less money for shorter sessions does seem to make sense on its face, right? Um, less time means uh, less money, right? Like that's a pretty universally agreed upon labor tactic here. But also it's important for us to keep in mind that the labor, the emotional involvement of a therapist in conducting a 30 minute session as opposed to a 50 minute session is really not all that different. Granted you're in session for slightly less time. However, the process of initiating rapport or talking about some stuff, doing some situating, wrapping up a session, making sure we end at a good place, making sure that we're creating some sense of closure and soothing and safety, um, and then wrapping the session and moving on to your next one. That's all the same, whether it's in 30 minutes or 45 minutes or 50 minutes. And so for some people, actually, it can be more difficult <laughs> to do 30 minute sessions than it is a 50 or 60 minute session. Because again, you're still having to do all of these same processes just in an accelerated timeline. And then to be paid $9.75 <laughs> for that 30 minutes is just, not appropriate. So let's talk about some of the other hours here. Um, I calculated this three different times based on different um, numbers of hours. So 20 hours for most people, especially working in private practice, having 20 clients in a week, like 20 client appointments in a week is generally considered full time, um, somewhere between 20 to 25. Like that's a lot of clients. <laughs> Again, it's just important for us to remember that we're not simply talking about working 20 hours a week and then you turn your computer off and go watch TV, right? Like. Um, we're doing a couple of hours of paperwork, a couple of hours of insurance billing, depending on whether you take insurance or not, administrative stuff, phone calls, intakes, check-ins, like communication, rescheduling, all of this other stuff that goes into the job. And so 20 to 25 hours for most people is like a pretty full caseload. BetterHelp qualifies this as part-time, however, which is interesting to me, for the 20 hours per week, which again would be 20 clients per week. And so for most people that would actually equate to 40 hours worth of work, you would be making $39,000 annually before taxes. After taxes, that would equate to roughly $25,350. So even if we round that up to be $25,500, still you're making under $25 an hour. Um, with the $25,350, 
figure um, annually, you'd be making $24.38 an hour. And again, that's for a 60 minute session. For 45 minutes, you would be making $18 an hour or for 30 minutes, you're making $12 an hour. I just like, again, this all goes without saying that the way that BetterHelp represents this is just not true. I don't think this is like, or the way that BetterHelp presents this can very much, I could see this being misleading to certain people. For what it's worth, we'll talk about the 40 hours or 40 clients per week, which again would amount to well over 40 hours a week, but their estimation would be that you'd make $100,000 annually or $100,100 annually before taxes, which would equate to $65,065 after taxes. So we're finally getting into a place where the hours are, <laughs> or the, the rates are feeling like a livable wage sort of $31.28 for an hour or $23.46 for 45 minutes or $15.64 for 30 minutes. The other thing that I want to draw people's attention to is that this like $30 an hour figure is really barely scraping minimum wage or, or like a living wage for people, especially with the way that inflation has affected our economy and things like that. Somebody who's gone to school, again, has a master's degree at minimum and has gone through several thousands of hours of education and training and things like that at minimum to be just barely cresting the $30 an hour mark when you're working well over 40 hours a week is not appropriate. And this is also really, really frustrating to see this rate structure normalized in the therapy world because as it is, therapists have a hard enough time feeling empowered to charge an amount of money that allows them to live uh, and pay their bills while also not overloading themselves with clients and really putting them in, in danger of burnout and things like that. I, for what it's worth, I took a national average cost for therapy on an hourly rate uh, at like a private practice place, uh, which was about $125 an hour. And so if you worked 20 uh, or you saw 20 clients per week at 52 weeks, like BetterHelp says that they estimate, um, you'd make $130,000 annually before taxes, uh, which equates to 84,500 after taxes, which is about $80 an hour. The math comes out to $81.25 an hour. This is why $125 for a session is a national average because that amount of money feels for a lot of therapists like a livable wage, again, to cover their costs, like owning their own business, but also to pay their bills and to live in a way that doesn't put them in danger of burnout and things like that. I know that that section is very numbers heavy. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to this though, because the truth is that when therapists are healthy and happy and not putting themselves at risk of burnout because they have to work so many hours at a discounted rate in order to make ends meet. The truth is that they are better therapists for that. They are able to provide people with the highest quality care. We're able to actually really effectively be there for our clients when we are charging rates that feel reflective of the amount of money that we actually need to live and to function and that also honors our credentials and our training. The last thing that I wanna talk about with you guys is the boundaries issue. This is another thing that I brought up in the original video, which is that BetterHelp has a lot of advertising that seems to communicate that clients can talk to their therapist either through text or video chat or audio call means anytime, anywhere, whenever they need to. They market in a way that makes the therapy seem akin to a crisis service. This is a really big problem in my opinion, because while crisis services do exist and they're incredibly impactful and very important work, clinical psychotherapy, outpatient psychotherapy, and crisis services are not the same thing and we should not be conflating the two. The truth is that healthy, uh, effective outpatient psychotherapy includes boundaries that mean that you can't contact your therapist anytime that you're having an emotional reaction to something. In some cases, this is actually a really important vehicle for clients to experience growth because when we go through the process of self soothing, of figuring out our own solution, and then unpack the emotional impact of that with our therapist later, there's a feeling of empowerment that happens. And like, wow, look at me, like I did that, you know? It feels good and it's an important moment for clients to learn that you can rely on yourself, that you can actually do this, that like your therapist is here to support you, to guide you, to sit in your passenger seat, but ultimately you are the one who has the skills, the tools, the resources, the knowledge to work through these really heavy, scary, challenging things in your own life. And yes, while it's very important, it's very impactful, it's necessary sometimes to have a therapist help guide you through that, to help be there for you to unpack that afterwards. Creating this dependency is so incredibly fucking unethical and really, really inappropriate to sell this message that clients will only 
only get better if they have free and unfettered access to their therapist at a moment's notice for the for foreseeable future is wholly irresponsible. I really, really fucking take issue with this because besides the fact that it puts therapists in a shitty position of feeling like, what am I supposed to fucking never have off hours now? Like, what am I on fucking call all the time? Like that sucks. But it also keeps clients dependent on the service. And I think especially in context with what we've seen from the FTC reporting that BetterHelp allegedly used user data to um, create their own financial benefit. I would not be surprised if there is potentially allegedly um, a motivation here to keep clients dependent on the service so that they never move away from it and continue to pay for it. In traditional psychotherapy, this is a thing that therapists receive explicit training about, that we're supposed to be very, very conscious of when our clients reach this threshold of being ready for discharge. And then we have a conversation about it because it's not fucking ethical for us to just keep a client on our caseload forever and ever and ever and ever without any conversation of taking a hiatus, taking a break, exploring what that looks like because it creates a dependency. The message that a lot of folks could absorb from this is that your very survival is dependent on me being available to you. And that's not fair. That's also not the fucking point of therapy. It's, we're not supposed to be putting ourselves up on this pedestal as these like godlike people who are just like, you're welcome. I fixed your whole fucking life. Like, ew, no, that's not appropriate. That's not cool. If your therapist does that to you, by the way, fucking run away because that fucking sucks. And I do want to be clear. There's an important caveat here. It is entirely common for folks to be sort of chronically in therapy, especially when you have conditions like CPTSD, a lot of childhood trauma, or you have ongoing trauma. For example, a lot of folks who were healthcare workers or service providers during the pandemic were just kind of chronically in therapy, regardless of what their past trauma history was, because it's a lot to work through trauma like that on a daily basis. And so that's an exception that's important for us to honor. However, even there, I would argue that taking a hiatus, having a break, even decreasing the frequency of your sessions with your therapist can go a long way in helping to inform this message that again, you are the empowered individual here, you have the skills, you have have the tools, we've done the learning together, and now it's time for you to fly. It's time for you to be allowed to go and, and live your life. I tell my clients all the time when we talk about discharge that I am confident you have cooler things to do than listen to me fucking talk once a week. And I want you to be able to live your best, freest, happiest life. And I will like cheer you on from afar, you know? Having that support in your back pocket also is a valuable resource, but keeping clients dependent on therapy is just unethical. You get the point that I'm making. I think I've talked about it for long enough, whatever. Moving on. For what it's worth, there have also been reports from other therapists, allegedly, um, who previously worked for BetterHelp, who shared feeling uh, pressured to take on clients when they were already full or to respond to messages or calls when they were off hours or overwhelmed and received feedback that felt very invalidating or uncomfortable, feedback that they weren't happy with um, when reaching out to BetterHelp corporate. And so this is another thing for us to be aware of. I think in traditional psychotherapy, it's hard enough to navigate the a tricky position that capitalism puts us in, um, in terms of having to charge rates that allow us to live a healthy and safe life while also trying to be accessible to clients, but adding a third party into this mix who by nature of the way that capitalism works, prioritizes a bottom line and uh, financial uh, feasibility, this creates further conflict here. And I think the way that therapists have spoken about this could potentially be a reflection of that issue. The issues that I take with BetterHelp are many. <laughs> um, I hope that if you've made it this far into the video that you're aware that generally speaking, I'm just not fucking a fan. I also want to make a clear distinction here too, that at the time I made the first video, I was very much willing to sort of look the other way and let it go when folks were promoting BetterHelp and things like that. And again, I do still stand by the fact that if you're a consumer and BetterHelp is your only access to therapy or it's a valuable resource for you right now, that's none of anybody's business but your own. And I really want to encourage you to continue seeking the support that you deserve, that you need, that you're entitled to, and to tell everybody else with any judgment to fuck all the fucking way off. Um, you're allowed. And again, uh, it's not my place to tell people what they should be doing um, when the truth is that resources are limited. However, um, I do think it's important for therapists and clinicians to draw a line, especially after the way that we've seen BetterHelp interact with this community, especially. I'm not the only creator who got a cease and desist. There were lots of people who received cease and desist over the years. Lots of people have talked about it. The way that they have interacted with clients, in my opinion, is enough to cause me to feel very distrustful of the entity, but especially the way that they've interacted with folks in our community, the way that they've behaved themselves in regards to 
members of our community, professionals who are trying to educate folks, who are trying to help people, who are trying to make these resources more affordable is just unforgivable in my opinion. So again, from the consumer perspective, I don't think the burden is on you guys to be making some kind of like principled decision. If you want to, obviously that, that's your business. I'm not, I'm not here to tell anybody what to do about your own healthcare. But as a clinician, again, I feel really compelled to put my foot down and say that like, this is not a service that I can support or promote. The harm here is the potential for harm here is entirely too great in my opinion. And I was sick and tired of being quiet about it. So we're talking about it now. Hopefully I don't get another cease and desist letter and hopefully this video doesn't get taken down, but I guess we will find out. Uh, if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching the video. Um, I appreciate you all so much. Um, I'm very curious what your guys' thoughts and feelings are. If you guys have um, your own experiences that you'd like to share. I did reach out to folks, by the way, on my Instagram story um, about their experiences with BetterHelp. For what it's worth, a lot of the consumer <laughs> feedback that I got was not positive. Um, and so that's also worth noting, but I chose not to share that in more detail just because some of it I felt like was crossing the line of potentially being identifiable. So we didn't go there, but for what it's worth, the folks that have spoken to me directly about it, the majority of them didn't seem to enjoy their interaction here. So that's it. I hope that you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, if you do like the video, like the video, it does very much support me um, and the channel and the work that we're trying to do here. The same thing goes with subscribing. It means a lot when you guys subscribe and join our community and, and are here. So thank you very much. Um, and then share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys next Saturday for probably a shorter and slightly lighter video. Okay, bye.